good evening, everybody. Um, appreciate you uh, you joining us tonight. Um, John, I'm very frustrated because you put that poll up, and it, uh, maybe it was because I'm a panelist or something, but I, I couldn't vote. I tried to <laughs> click the button, but it wouldn't work. But I've definitely had <laughs> had uh, head breakdowns, so uh, um, more than a few. So uh, so you could add add one to the tally for, for me if you would. Uh, as John said, the uh, subject tonight is uh, we're going to be talking about uh, dealing with uh, aircraft breakdowns uh, while you're um, away from home, and specifically the three rules that we uh, have developed uh, for doing this. Um, you know, I'm probably best known these days uh, for being a mechanic, but the, the fact is I've been an aircraft owner a whole lot longer than I've been a mechanic, and uh, that's part of why I have sort of a different take on on maintenance than most of the mechanics you've talked to. I've, I've actually been a pilot for 50 years. I've, uh, I bought my first uh, aircraft 48 years ago, and um, I fly lots of long trips in the airplane, um, including at least one or two transcontinental trips a year and lots of lots of uh, uh, shorter cross countries. Um, aviation is a very rich endeavor and there's there's lots of things. Uh, some people like aer uh, aerobatics, some people like air racing, some people like $100 hamburgers. Personally, I think that taking long cross countries is one of the most rewarding things that general aviation has to offer and even after 50 years, I simply never get tired of uh, of being able to see the expanse of this country and uh, even beyond this country from the perspective of a general aviation airplane, which is like like no other way to see the country. And you know, over the time that I've been doing this, it has been been getting easier and easier to use general aviation for serious cross country flying. Um, having uh, real-time weather in the cockpit was a major game changer for me. Um, having uh, iPads and four flight, uh, self-serve fuel uh, every place, uh, Uber when when you land because it used to be the ground transportation was always a problem at small airports. Um, it's just uh, it's just a great experience. Uh, except when something goes wrong with the airplane while you're away from home, and that tends to be an aircraft owner's worst nightmare because you're you're typically stuck somewhere you really don't want to be. Uh, you're you're uh, you're dependent on strangers to help you out. It's a very very uncomfortable feeling to uh, be away from home and have a broken airplane. And uh, you know for a long time. Uh, I thought that, you know, why don't we have a solution for this in general aviation? Why isn't there the equivalent of a AAA for airplanes? Well, I wound up st starting um, uh, Savvy about eight years ago, and uh, we're the largest firm in the world uh, specializing in the management and maintenance for uh, owner flown general aviation aircraft and 95% of the aircraft that we manage are, are, are piston powered. Uh, we, we manage the maintenance of more than 700 uh, piston GA aircraft now and uh, over the eight years uh, analyzing our database we found that uh, our typical client, managed maintenance client, has some sort of a breakdown on the road um, about once every two years on average. So we deal with more than 350 um, AOGs per year. Um, I'll, I'll be using the term AOG from time to time as we talk tonight. It's a, it's 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 a maintenance speak. It, it stands for aircraft on ground, and it basically means an, an airplane that's stuck somewhere and not flyable. So if I say AOG, it's kind of a it's kind of a synonym for for, for the term breakdown. Um, so in any case, uh, uh, about two years ago, uh, I started talking to John about this, 
and saying, you know, we really ought to be able to put together something that's the the equivalent of AAA for airplanes, so that when people have airplane problems on the road, uh, they they have a a toll-free number to call and they have help available whenever they need it. And of course, these breakdowns typically always seem to happen at the worst possible times on nights and weekends and holidays and stuff like that. And so uh, uh, we formed a little partnership with uh, with Sporties and created something called the Sporties Breakdown Assistance uh, Program. Um, and it uh, it it's a very inexpensive program designed to 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 cover you for breakdowns when you're more than 50 miles away from home base. Uh, in other words, far enough away that you can't rely on your regular shop or mechanic to to help you out. Um, we provide a 24/7 toll-free hotline. Uh, we, from the time you call, we uh, almost always will get back to you with an experienced ANPIA who knows the systems in your aircraft within 15 minutes of the time you call, day or night, weekends, holidays, and the cost of the program is uh, about $150 a year for for a piston single. Um, it took us about a year working with Sporties to put this thing together. It was kind of complicated, uh, a lot of moving parts to, to make this happen. Um, we wound up having to interface a bunch of computers with one another and develop APIs so that they could talk with one another uh, because uh, uh, people sign up through Sporties. Uh, Sporties computer has to tell our computer uh, who's signed up for the program and the details about the airplanes and that sort of thing. Um, we have a 24/7 call center uh, that's uh, uh, that's in uh, uh, Columbus, Ohio, um, and their computer has to interface with our computer so that when you call the hotline, the person at the call center takes down your information and it automatically goes into our computer. And then our, our computer has to figure out which mechanics are on call at that particular time of day by interfacing with the Google Calendar, and then they wind up sending text messages and robocalls and stuff to get the uh, uh, to, to get the uh, the mechanic uh, in touch with you. And it all has worked really smoothly, and we typically have been getting back within within five or ten minutes of the time that somebody calls the hotline. So um, it's. Uh, it's it's been an interesting experience, but um, let me talk to you about how we handle uh, breakdowns when these when when we do get these calls. Um, we have a philosophy that we call owner first, airplane second, and it's kind of unique. And I, and and I'm going to illustrate to you what this means. But basically, when when an aircraft owner calls us. Uh, stuck somewhere with a broken airplane, our mindset is that our job is not to fix the airplane, it's to resolve the owner's predicament. Sometimes fixing the airplane is the best way to resolve the owner's predicament, but frequently uh, fixing the airplane is exactly the wrong thing to do. And uh, that seems a little counterintuitive, but um, I I'm going to give you some specific examples so you can see what I mean. We've developed three rules that we use to guide the way we handle uh, breakdowns. And these three rules um, have been developed, you know, I, bet, I guess I would say, through the school of hard knocks. Uh, we've, we've handled lots of problems, dealt with lots of, of maintenance facilities, uh, had pretty much everything that can go wrong go wrong, and, and uh, as a result of that, have learned a lot about the best way to handle these things. So, let me briefly review the rules with you, and then I'll give you some real-life examples of, of of how they actually uh, put into play. The first rule is: do not put your airplane in a shop until you know what's wrong with it, or until you have gone as far as you can in diagnosing the problem. When aircraft owners have an airplane problem, their their first knee-jerk reaction is usually to find a mechanic and put their airplane in his maintenance hangar. And if you do that, 
uh, the, the chances are about 100 to 1 that the first thing the mechanic's going to do is start attacking the airplane with tools. Uh, we really don't want him to do that until we have a really good idea of what's wrong because it may not be necessary to take your airplane apart and it often isn't and so you know when we deal with breakdowns our, our first goal is to gather data and do a, diagno a diagnosis not to try to fix the airplane but to try to assess what's wrong with the airplane. Rule, uh, rule number two is don't perform maintenance away from home if you can possibly avoid it. If if we can diagnose a problem and determine that the airplane is safe to fly home, then flying at home and dealing with the problem when you get home is almost always the best course of action. Uh, and uh, Or if you can't fly home, at least fly it to a convenient location uh, where, to have the work done where you have a shop that you know and trust and who has expertise with your airplane. And in dealing with literally thousands of these breakdown episodes over the years, what we found is that about half the time, pro probably a little more than half the time, um, we're able to review the symptoms and the data, come up with a diagnosis, and, and tell the aircraft owner, this is not a safety of flight issue, it's okay to fly home, we'll deal with it when you get back, or it's okay to continue your trip and deal with it at a more convenient place and a more convenient time. So we try really hard not to do maintenance away from home if we can possibly avoid it. And surprising amount of time, we can. And the third and final rule is, if maintenance away from home is unavoidable, if we do have a safety of flight issue, then we want to do the absolute minimum necessary to get the airplane in a condition where it can fly home safely and do the rest of it when the airplane gets home. So we may want to do a temporary fix, something quick and dirty, get the airplane flyable, fly at home, and have the maintenance done at home. We really try hard not to do maintenance on the road if you can possibly avoid it. Um, so the rules are simple, but the application sometimes is not real straightforward. So let, let me relate a few real life war stories of, of some breakdowns that we've dealt with um, in, in recent times that kind of illustrate why these rules are so important. And I'll start off talking about a fellow by the name of Gary Troop, uh, who lives in Destin, Florida, has a 2009 Cirrus SR22 turbo normalized airplane. Um, uh, Gary um, found himself stuck in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, he was about to launch for home back at Destin. Uh, and his hope was to get home in time for dinner. Um, and he got in the airplane in Tallahassee to fly home to Destin and discovered he couldn't get the engine to start. Um, he, he called us. He described the symptoms. He said when he turned the key that he could hear the starter making noise, but the prop just twitched and it wouldn't really turn and the engine couldn't start. From his description, the, pro, the the diagnosis was was immediately obvious. It's a, it's a classic symptom of a slipping starter drive adapter in a Continental engine, um, and th that's a fairly common failure mode, and it has exactly the symptoms that Gary described. So um, when we explained to him what what was wrong, his first reaction was what most owners would well. I guess I need to put the airplane in the shop here. And it, as it happens, there was a Cirrus authorized service center on the field of Tallahassee. And so Gary said, well, I'll, I'll call the Cirrus service center, have them tow the aircraft into their shop and replace the starter drive adapter. And that's the reaction that I think most owners in Gary's position would have. Our reaction was immediately to ask Gary, please not to do that. 
because we knew that would not result in a good outcome for him. For one thing, we knew that Continental starter drive adapters were, were 10 days back ordered, and so he wouldn't be able to, the shop would not be able to get him one uh, for a minimum of 10 days. And um, it's also a four hour uh, labor job to, to remove the old starter adapter and install a new one. And so, you know, basically, if Gary took his airplane and put it in the shop in Tallahassee, that airplane was going to be stuck there for about two weeks. And we didn't think Gary was going to be very happy being stuck in Tallahassee. So what we did was um, uh, advised him, instead of putting the airplane in the, in the, in the shop, to call the local FBO and ask them to bring over their ground power unit and plug it into his airplane and give him a 28 volt ground power unit start. Because we know from experience when Continental starter drive adapters start to slip during normal 24 volt starts, um, they are almost always good for a, at least a few more starts if you power the airplane with, from a 28 volt ground power unit. So we figured he had a real good chance of getting the airplane started that way. He'd be able to fly at home, uh, have dinner at home, have the have the work done at his home shop. Much better outcome for Gary. And um, so that's what we advised him to do. The next thing that happened was uh, he called back about 20 minutes later uh, from his cell phone. You could hear his, the engine running in the background and said that the engine started just fine on 28 volts and then he was about to launch for home. We, we then proceeded to call the uh, director of maintenance at Gary's regular shop in Destin, explained his situation, asked them to order a replacement starter drive adapter so that it would, uh, uh, they'd have it to put it in his airplane and Gary made it home for dinner. So this is a textbook case of what uh, I, I meant when, when I said that our philosophy is owner first, airplane second. Um, the, in, instead of focusing on fixing the airplane, we focused on solving Gary's problem, which was to get himself in the airplane home. And, and the result is a, was a much better outcome. Um, if he put it in the shop, he would probably had to arrange for alternate transportation home and then a couple of weeks later, he'd have to arrange for transportation back to Tallahassee so he could get his airplane. And the work was going to be done at, at a strange shop instead of the, the shop that he was used to and so on. So it was, it was just a, a better way to do it. Um, now sometimes um, it's not quite that simple. Sometimes uh, uh, we really do have to do maintenance on the airplane uh, to make it flyable. And to illustrate that point, um, uh, I'll talk about uh, another breakdown situation we had. This this one was um, an aircraft owner by the name of Mark Bellaccio, uh, lives in the Bay Area, has a beautiful 1980 Cessna 195. Um, and uh, as it happened, Mark uh, and his wife flew in the airplane to Minden, Nevada. Um, where his wife's mom lives. Uh, his wife's mom was sick and they flew out there to spend some time taking care of her. And w when the mom was was uh, was on the mend, they went out to the airport to fly home. Um, but when Mark went to start his uh, Cessna 185, he discovered that there was no oil pressure, which is not uh, exactly what you would like to see in a situation like that. So um, he asked around to find out whether there was an A&P who could come look at his airplane on a Saturday. And it turns out that um, there was one A&P on the field um, that lived nearby. So Mark called him and the guy came out and opened up his hangar and they pulled Mark airplanes in. Uh, the A&P hooked an external pressure gauge to the engine, started it briefly and verified that indeed there really was no well pressure. It wasn't just a problem with this gauge. 
the mechanic uh, removed the oil filter, cut it open, told Mark that the oil filter was full of, of bearing metal and that the engine uh, was going to need a teardown. The mechanic goes back into his office for a few minutes and emerges with a written estimate covering engine removal, teardown, and reinstallation totaling more than $10,000. Um, Mark was not a happy camper. Uh, he decided to give us a call at this point because he, he wanted some help and wanted a second opinion. Um, so I, I asked Mark if he could uh, take an iPhone photo of the metal that the A&P mechanic found in the oil filter so I could get some idea of the magnitude of the disaster and a few minutes later um, Mark uh, sent a couple of photos of the uh, of the oil filter media which I studied quite closely and um, there were as you can see there, there were a few little flecks of metal in the filter but nothing uh, nothing particularly alarming um, and, and I, I just couldn't imagine that somebody would look at those few flecks of metal in the oil filter and suddenly condemn the engine to death. That seemed like a completely unreasonable response. I, um, I asked Mark a couple of questions to, to try to eliminate some of the obvious things. I said, did you check the oil on the dipstick? Is there enough oil? In the engine, he said, yeah, there's plenty of oil in the engine, but, but they couldn't get any oil pressure. Well, under those circumstances, the most likely reason for no oil pressure would be a contaminated oil pressure relief valve, um, something that sits on the back of the engine, on the back of the oil pump, and regulates oil pressure. It's a little, little spring-loaded plunger that acts as an oil pressure regulator, and if if some foreign material gets stuck in it and, and holds the plunger open, um, you won't get oil pressure when you start the engine. So I suggested that Mark have the uh, mechanic remove the relief valve housing and inspect to see if there's any contamination in there. Um, it seemed like a much more reasonable first step than just immediately deciding that the engine has to be removed and torn down. Um, about a half an hour later, um, Mark uh, sends me another little photograph and says, sure enough, we opened the pressure relief valve and we found this little little speck of metal um, about the size of a, so smaller than a broken pencil point, uh, stuck in the oil pressure relief valve. Um, I asked him to check that piece of metal with a magnet and see whether it was ferrous or non-ferrous. Uh, and he said it was not magnetic. Um, looking at the photo, and he verified this, the, the metal was silvery in color, not coppery in color, so I was quite certain that it was a little chunk of aluminum, that it wasn't bearing material. And I said to Mark, you know, I'm not really concerned about this little piece of aluminum being stuck in the oil pressure relief valve unless there's a whole bunch more uh, little pieces of aluminum floating around in the oil pan. And so we really need to check that. Um, however, the uh, turns out the A and P was just he, he was getting belligerent. He was not interested in going any further with diagnostic procedures. He still insisted that the engine needed to be torn down, and uh, getting kind of confrontational. And Mark was starting to freak out, and he's worried that this mechanic's going to ground his airplane and hold it hostage and stuff. Um, so I told him not to panic. We had a little further conversation, and it turns out that Mark's kind of handy with tools and does his own oil changes and carries a, a pretty good emergency toolkit in, in the airplane when he flies. And uh, since this mechanic was st starting to use strong arm tactics on him, I suggested that Mark direct the A&P to put the airplane back together, give him a logbook entry for the work he performed, pay his bill and get his airplane out of there before the A&P started dismantling the airplane any further. Um, the mechanic was not happy about this, gave Mark kind of a nasty, gratuitous looking logbook entry that talked about all the stuff he found in the filter. Mechanics are not supposed to do that. Um, 
logbook entries are supposed to describe the work performed. They're not supposed to describe what's wrong with the airplane, but uh, this mechanic couldn't resist making editorial comments, and I told Mark, don't don't get into a fight with him. Just accept the logbook entry and get your airplane out of there. Um, so he did. Uh, he also, the mechanic insisted on being paid with a cashier's check before he would release the aircraft to Mark, but uh, eventually they got that sorted out and he got the airplane out of jail. So I then started to work with him to see if this airplane was safe to fly home. Uh, first of all, I asked him to run up the engine and see if it was making well pressure now that they took that little piece of aluminum out of the relief valve and Mark sent me a picture of the oil pressure gauge, said, yeah, it was making oil pressure just fine. Um, I was still worried that there might be more aluminum floating around in the engine, so I asked him whether he could figure out some way to to drain the oil through some window screen or cheesecloth or something to see whether there was metal in it. Um, he, he did that, sent me a picture of a, some cheesecloth in a bucket that just had a lot of oil in it, but, but no metal. Uh, so that was good. Um, I, I had Mark do, do a 30-minute ground run, uh, had him do a full power high-speed taxi down the long runway at the airport. Uh, all the signs were good, and um, so ultimately, uh, without, without uh, belaboring this, we decided between the two of us that uh, we thought this airplane was safe to fly home, which is where it was really the objective. Um, and it was late in the day, so they checked into a hotel the next morning. They flew back home to the Bay Area. The engine performed just fine. Oil pressure was rock steady all the way. Not long after he got home, uh, the airplane went into a very good shop for an annual inspection, and we found out where that chunk of aluminum came from. It turned out that the oil filter adapter had, had been loose and vibrating, and it was it was uh, uh, making some metal from from the, the threads, and it was something that was relatively easy to repair, did not require removing or tearing down the engine. And it would have really been a crime if, if, if that had been the outcome. Um, but again, my objective was to, in this case, to do the minimum maintenance possible to get the airplane back home, and that's what we did. Uh, it turned out to be a much better outcome for uh, mark than the alternative would have been. Um, the last war story I'll tell you is one that happened um, uh, quite recently, and it was it was kind of a kind of a fun one. It involved a uh, a fellow from my Nigeria with an unpronounceable <laughs> name, uh, but uh, but he but but everybody calls him Lola, um, and Lola was. Uh, was, had decided that he was going to become the first African to fly solo uh, around the world. And he was going to do this in a 2004 Cirrus SR-22. Um, got a whole bunch of sponsors, started off on this on this mission. Uh, the airplane left from, I guess the, they started off in Washington, D.C. Um, to uh, on a round the world solo flight. Um, this is a Cirrus SR-22. It's an all-electric airplane with kind of wall-to-wall -wall glass. It's a, in an Avidine a glass cockpit. At any rate, he, uh, he left Washington, flew up to Canada, and uh, then on a, the leg from uh, Gooseberry, Labrador to Reykjavik, Iceland, the airplane developed an electrical system problem. Um, and uh, that's particularly serious in a Cirrus because it's an all-electric airplane and you cannot afford to lose the electrics in a Cirrus. And basically what happened was that during this leg, he suddenly got an alarm and, noted, and, and, and saw that the, uh, the voltage reading on the E-bus, the emergency bus, um, was about 13 volts. Um, it's supposed to be 28 volts. The main bus voltage was correct, but the emergency bus voltage was um, was about half of what it's supposed to be, or less than half what it was supposed to be. And um, he, he was quite concerned about that, understandably. Um, the um, 
So he lands at Reykjavik, takes it into the, the shop at Reykjavik. None of the mechanics at Reykjavik had any experience with the Cirrus electrical system, which is a pretty complicated um, multi-bus system with two batteries and two alternators and five or six different buses and, and stuff like that. Uh, the mechanics there perform, performed some rudimentary checks um, and concluded that both of the alternators were were functioning properly. They did not have, they could not figure out why he was getting this low voltage reading on the emergency bus, but the the uh, electrical system in the Cirrus is controlled by a, a complicated and expensive box called an MCU master control unit, and they recommended that he order a replacement master control unit from Cirrus, um, which would have cost him about three grand and would have taken a, a week to, to get there and get installed um, while he was trying to do his round the world trip. So uh, before, since he, he didn't really have any confidence that these mechanics knew what they were doing and they admitted to him they really didn't, they didn't have any experience with the Cirruses or the Cirrus electrical system. So he contacted us. Um, as soon as I found out it was an electrical problem, uh, the, I assigned it to, uh, to to Jeff Eskirka, who's my technical director. It also happens to be w one of the most expert people I know on the Cirrus electrical system, which is a pretty complicated system. Uh, Jeff had Lola download his engine monitor data, took a look at it, um, and concluded that, in fact, the e-bus voltage was not 13 volts that it was that, that it was what it was supposed to be but that the readout was was faulty the, the the glass panel readout was lying and it was because of a fault in a in a box called the sensor interface unit or SIU um, so Jeff explained to, to Lola what was going on, that he that they really did not have an electrical system problem. He had an indication problem, uh, and that to fix that indication problem was, was going to require replacing the sensor interface unit and something. Um, uh, Lola, who's a very experienced pilot, airline pilot and so on, asked the exact correct question of Jeff. He said, well, what's the worst that could happen if I continue on to the UK in this condition because the UK was going to be the next place where he could find a Sarah service center that could replace his SIU. Uh, and Jeff told Lola that, um, that if the, the SIU got sicker he could start losing other indications or maybe all of the indications on, on his MFD engine page um, but that the airplane would still be safe to fly and it has backup steam gauges for all the critical things. Um, and after having that conversation, uh, Lola made the decision that he would continue on to the UK and take the plane to the Cirrus Service Center near London when he got there to have the SIU replaced. So he, he launches for England and, and guess what happened while he was flying over the North Atlantic, exactly the scenario that Jeff had described. The uh, SIU went tango uniform and basically all of the indications on his uh, engine page went blank. And he, he, he took this nice picture and sent it to us after he, after he landed. Um, when he got to the UK, Lola emailed Jeff a thank you note and, and one of the things he said in the thank you note, he said, because you warned me that this could happen, I was ready for it, I didn't panic and I just pretended I was flying my old steam gauge equipped Cessna, which I thought was just great. In any case, the service center in the UK replaced the SIU and Lola continued his round the world, round the world flight uh, successfully. So I, th I thought that was kind of a nice story. At um, any rate, let's just quickly review, uh, in, in light of all of that stuff, the, the three rules. Don't put your airplane in the shop until you've diagnosed the problem. Um, and we find that it's, it's amazing how uh, often, in the vast majority of the cases, uh, a problem can be diagnosed remotely simply by, uh, through a combination of of asking about 
the symptoms, uh, sometimes downloading engine monitor data, but we normally can diagnose problems, almost always can diagnose problems without taking anything apart, and that's what we want to do. We don't want to attack an airplane with tools until we've gathered all the data that we can gather and figured out what's wrong with the airplane. Uh, rule two is don't perform maintenance away from home base if you can possibly avoid it. We always want to try to fly the airplane home or to a more convenient place to have maintenance, like in Lola's case, to get it to uh, get it, get it to the Sarah Service Center in England. Um, and rule three, if maintenance away from home is unavoidable, like it was in the case of, of uh, March 185, then do the absolute minimum necessary to fly home. We needed to get the little piece of aluminum out of the pressure relief valve. We did not need to tear down the engine. <laughs> Uh, so we want to just do the minimum necessary to make the airplane safe to fly home and uh, and then deal with the rest of it after you get home. Um, so John, that's that's really all the prepared material I have. I, I hope that was uh, instructive and uh, why don't we open it up for, for Q&A. Great, Mike. Thanks for that and uh, appreciate the examples there that really put some real world uh, experience behind it. We do have a number of questions and folks, uh, we've got a, uh, plenty of time left to ask some, so keep asking them uh, in that control panel there. Start off with one, Mike, that I know uh, you write about a lot, so I'm sure you have an opinion on. Uh, what do you do if you're in one of these situations where uh, the mechanic won't release your airplane? You alluded to that a little bit with the 185 scenario, but what are your rights as an owner and what are the responsibilities for an A&P or an IA um, if, if he just flat out thinks you're, you're an idiot and you're unsafe, what are your rights as an owner with your airplane in a shop? Well, um, you know, sometimes things get difficult. Um, and the case with the 185 was, was one case where things got really testy between the owner and the mechanic. Um, but, I mean, the shorter answer is no mechanic has the right to ground your airplane. Um, if the airplane is in um, is is going into the shop for an annual inspection, um, then the mechanic has the right to to make a determination. Not only right, the obligation to make a determination whether the airplane is airworthy or not. But if you're taking the airplane into a, into a shop to to fix something, and it's not the in the context of an annual inspection then you're not asking for an airworthiness determination. The mechanic is not obligated to make an airworthiness determination. And in, in, in fact, his opinion of the airworthiness of the airplane is really irrelevant to anything. Um, the, the, I, I've written about this, and I think an instructive uh, analogy is, uh, is, is that the, the situation with airworthiness of an airplane is very much like um, the way um, pilot aviation medical condition is assessed. You know, once every year, two years, five years, whatever, um, we are supposed to go, we are required to go to an aviation medical examiner. I, I know that changes in May, but, but, but humor me. Um, and get a professional determination as to whether we're fit to fly. Every other day of the year, it's up to us to self-certify that we're fit to fly. That's exactly the way it works with airplanes. Once a year, we are required to hire an IA to make a formal, professional airworthiness determination of the aircraft. In any other, every, you know, 364 days out of the year, um, the determination as to whether the airplane is, is safe to fly uh, is, lies with the pilot in command, not with the mechanic. Um, and an example that I use a lot when I'm teaching IA renewal seminars, because a, a lot of mechanics don't really get this, is I tell a mechanic, imagine, imagine somebody brings a Cessna 182 into you, and there's two things obviously wrong with it. One, one is the, the right main uh, tire is flat, and the other is that the left wing is missing. And the pilot asks you to replace the, the flat tire. Um, can you do that and sign off the airplane? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, 
you 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 do what the what the owner asks you to do. Your logbook entry describes the work you did, which was to to replace the right main tire. Your signature in the logbook simply denotes that the work that you did and described in the logbook book entry was done um, uh, satisfactorily. It does not say anything about whether the airplane is airworthy. Um, now the mechanic certainly could say to the owner, by the way, while I was working on your right main tire, I could not help but notice that the left wing was missing. And just let me give you some friendly advice. If I were you, I would not try to fly the airplane until that, that, that wing was, was, was reinstalled. But the mechanic can't ground the airplane because it's got the missing wing. The airworthiness of the airplane is not the mechanic's affair. It's the pilot in command who makes a decision whether that airplane is safe to fly, except in the context of an annual inspection, which is the, the one time that you are asking a mechanic to make an airworthiness determination. So, great. Yeah, great insight. Uh, so, so mechanics, other than when, when you are doing an annual, a mechanic cannot ground your airplane. He can, he he can, and they often do use all sorts of intimidation tactics on owners, but they have no right to ground the airplane, and their determination about airworthiness is really not not relevant and has no regulatory significance. Related to that, Mike, we've had a number of questions here about you know how do you there's some horror stories here. How do you find the right shop? So. That's uh, obviously something that is part of this program. So maybe you could talk real briefly about if you have a breakdown uh, and you call up, how do you make sure you don't get stuck in uh, one of these shops that may be less than reputable? Well, um, you, you know, the, one, one, of the, one of the nice things about this breakdown assistance program is that, is that you know, we, we deal with hundreds and hundreds of shops. We have... Uh, an extensive database of maintenance resources all over the country and, and actually out of the country as well. Um, we record our experiences with the shops. We've got a neat little proprietary Google Map application where we can, uh, in, if, if, if somebody calls stuck in a certain place, we can pull up all the shops within a 100 or 200 mile radius of where the airplane's stuck and they show up with, with nice little color coded uh, uh, icons, you know, green if we if, if we've had good experiences with the shop, red if we've had terrible experiences, you know, um, yellow if they've been sort of mediocre. But the other thing is, um, it, it's it's really important to. I mean, some sometimes you you just you you just have to use whoever is available. But the 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 key is to keep them on a very tight leash. You know, you, the 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 mechanic. Is is the you know the hands and the toolbox, but you don't want to you, you don't want to relinquish the the decision making to the mechanic. The decision making is is something that the owner is supposed to do. The mechanic is supposed to carry out the owner's wishes, um, and uh, it sometimes it's it's hard for 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 owners to take the, the appropriately assertive stance in dealing with, with maintenance people to get them to do what they want and to, to, and to get them not to do what they don't want done. Um, th that's when it can be very helpful to have, uh, you know, uh, somebody like us where, where we're talking to the guy mechanic to mechanic and, and, and we know exactly, uh, you know, how, how to deal with these guys. Um, you know, I, I have you talked about that 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 guy in Minden who wanted to tear down the engine. You know, if you put yourself in that mechanic's position, here is some some itinerant pilot who he's never seen before, who he'll probably never seen see again. Um, he doesn't know whether the guy is 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 a, a litigious, nasty person, or whether he's a nice guy, or anything. And when a mechanic's in a situation like this, 
all he sees is liability. And so mechanics will tend to, to, to be overly conservative in their recommendations uh, because they want to minimize their liability exposure or what they perceive to be the liability exposure. And this mechanic knows, you know, if he does something to the engine, puts it back together, and then something bad happens, it's going to be on him. But if he if he transfers the liability to an overhaul shop and says, now we got to pull this engine, send it off somewhere, then he's off the hook. You know, he's not liable anymore. Somebody else is liable. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of mechanic decision making is done out of fear of liability and um, it, 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 one has to be, you know, f fairly assertive to prevent being victimized by that sort of thing. That what, what happened in Minden was not all that unusual in my experience, um, and and it's kind of the knee-jerk reaction that you'll often find when mechanics are dealing with with pilots that they they don't have a relationship with. Along those lines, Mike, we've had a couple questions um, from folks who are saying, you know, what is that shop's liability in the example of, uh, you know, he recommends that you uh, fix a, fix something and you say no and, and blast off. You know, what's that shop's liability if they have recommended service and you say no and then heaven forbid something happens? Uh, is that, are they going to be on the hook for that? Well, um, you know, the, I, I think that that let, let's let's give that A and P and Menden the benefit of the doubt, and let's say that his concerns were were well taken. Let let's say he, he had real concerns that that engine might come apart. There, there's a right way and a wrong way to deal with that, and the the right way for a mechanic to deal with that is to give the owner advice, and then write that advice down on a piece of paper, sign it, ask the owner to co-sign it, and keep a copy. That way, if the, if the owner flies home and the airplane crashes and somebody um, tries to blame the mechanic, the mechanic has his get-out-of-jail-free get card. He's got a, a, a signed document that proves that he advised the owner not to fly the airplane with a counter signature that the owner in, in, indeed uh, uh, received that advice and, um, and 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 the mechanic is is off the hook mechanic can't it, 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 the decision whether to fly the airplane or not is not the mechanics decision it, it's it's the owner's decision the mechanic has an obligation to give the the owner his best advice but he doesn't have the authority to enforce that advice um, and and that's where that's where the, the the tricky part comes in. So this mechanic in 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 Menden could have handled things in a much better way than he did. Um, and the owner probably could have handled things in a better way than he did. Um, I I you know I got into the middle of about halfway through and felt like it needed to be de-escalated. <laughs> But it's not it's not a it's not an unusual situation for you know owners and mechanics to 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 wind up um, in a in a confrontational situation. And and that's a I think a great point we're stressing there, Mike, is if something does happen, um, and you know certainly if you're a breakdown assistance uh, member, you want to you want to call Savvy right away. Uh, you know you don't want right. to wait until this thing goes off the rails and and the airplane is taken apart and then try to try to save it. The answer is to get involved from the very beginning, right? Absolutely. And, and one, one of the most important reasons for that, John, is that um, the minute the mechanic attacks the airplane with tools, he typically uh, uh, eliminates the ability to gather data um, because the airplane is non-functional. And so we can't ask the pilot to run up the engine and try different things and tell us what he sees and so on because the because because the airplane's in pieces um, and so we don't want the airplane to be in pieces both because that, that precludes us gathering the information we need to do a diagnosis and also because you know as I said 
least 50% of the time, it turns out that there's no reason to take the airplane apart. We diagnose the problem. We say it's okay to fly to England that way, you know, and and deal with it there. Um, so we we don't want we don't want to take the airplane apart un unless we've determined that it really needs to be taken apart in order to be safe to fly. Mike, we've had uh, switching topics just a little bit here. We've had a number of questions on the relate to um, sort of the program itself and, and what is covered. In particular, uh, three or four questions on experimental aircraft. Can you talk maybe just briefly about sort of what airplanes are covered, any any sort of fine print or things like that? Um, well, um, yeah, John, you know, we, you and I have had this conversation. Uh -huh. I think I think the way we have things written up right now, uh, the program all, only covers certificated airplanes. We, um, I mean, we're okay with providing breakdown assistance service to experimental airplanes to the extent that the problem is with certificated components in experimental aircraft. I mean, for example, the, the vast majority of breakdown assistance um, calls are calls about engine issues. Um, and the engines in these airplanes, to a large extent, particularly if they're RVs and stuff, are certificated engines. So we have no, no problem with that. The reason we have, we, we have problems with experimentals is because we don't have, we, we, we can't, we can't get a maintenance manual and, 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 and look it up. There, there, there isn't one. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we, we do uh, work actually with quite a few RVs. Um, when you get to the more exotic experimentals, we, we, it, it becomes increasingly difficult for us to provide service for them because we just don't have access to the to, to the maintenance documentation that you would need. Yeah, and I think that the same goes. There's been a couple questions about, you know, how about for coverage outside of the U.S. or coverage for Alaska or Canada. And, and our general approach has been we only want to offer coverage and service where we can offer really good service. So it's not necessarily, a, you know, an arbitrary uh, line we're drawing somewhere, but, um, you know, we want to offer service where we know we can offer good service. So I'd say for those folks who have particular questions, feel free to drop me a line. My email's there on the screen, Zimmerman at sporties.com. Uh, and we can look at particular situations. Uh, as Mike said, you know, an, an RV uh, 12 with a with pretty standard setup is one thing. Uh, an exotic one-off uh, airplane that's based in northern Canada. Uh, we'd love to say yes to that, but probably just can't, you know, commit to delivering the service that, that you would expect from it. Um, one last question, Mike, as we as we wind down here, and again, uh, a lot of questions here on kind of this legal side, so I don't mean to, you know, focus on that too much, but that's where a lot of the questions are, and this has to do with insurance, uh, and this gets to kind of your broader point about um, your philosophy of maintenance, and it's, it's okay to defer maintenance sometimes. Are there insurance considerations there? You know, does your, does your insurer not like it if you're flying an airplane uh, that has known squawks or has deferred maintenance or anything like that? Is there, is there anything you should be aware of or questions you should ask or paperwork you should keep in order uh, when you're thinking about a subject like insurance? Um, I've, I've had a lot of very long talks with a number of very high-ranking uh, aviation insurance underwriters um, uh, about various things like that and, and notably, for instance, the issue of operating um, engines and propellers uh, past TBO. Um, I, I think I've, I've, I have been quoted as saying in the past that I have more hours in my airplane over TBO than I have under TBO, which is a, a dubious <laughs> distinction. But in any case, the, the, the basic answer to the, to the question is, um, um, for, first of all, there are no insurance policies, at least in the United States, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll put a caveat on that because I actually have seen some, uh, some, some issues with some policies like down in Australia which are written a little differently than what we're used to here. But at least in the U.S. there's no 
there, there's no such thing as an insurance policy that 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 has uh, TVO limitations um, or any um, any sort of airworthiness requirement uh, beyond the FAA's airworthiness requirement. Um, the, the, the basic requirement of, of most insurance policies is simply that the airplane has to be airworthy and the pilot has to be airworthy. And by that, they mean they, they mean airworthy the way the FAA means airworthy. There's no insurance company that has its own private set of airworthiness standards. They all use the FAA's airworthiness standards. So, for instance, for a Part 91 airplane, the FAA says the, the airplane has to have an annual inspection once a year. So if you fly the airplane out of annual, you will not be covered. Uh, your, your insurance won't cover you. Um, similarly, it says that you, ha you have to have a third class medical. Um, and if you fly the airplane and you don't have, and you have an expired medical, you may not be covered. Um, although in, in many states, you would still be covered if unless, uh, unless the insurance company could show that the airplane accident in some way was caused by by, by a medical issue. Um, but there's no case where an insurance company requires um, some kind of airworthiness uh, standard that is different than the, than the FAA standard. Um, so if you're if if the airplane is FAA legal, uh, you're covered. Now there's actually a different part of that question, which is okay. I'm I'm covered, but what happens when it when it's time to come up for renewal? And that's a harder question to answer because insurance companies um, can have very arbitrary guidelines as to what. Um, risks they want to take on and what risks they don't want to take on. Um, there's some insurance companies that don't like to f insure twins or some insurance companies that don't like to in, in, insure senior citizens like me uh, and they they don't have to I mean the, the, they can do anything they want when it comes to deciding uh, whether they want to take you on as a client or renew you. Um, having said that um, my airplane has been insured over the years by a number of the major underwriters and most of the time that I renew my policy I report the time on the engines which is way over TBO and I've never had an insurance company not renew me because the engines were over TBO so um, but they could if they wanted to insurance companies can do anything they want to with regard to Deciding whether to renew you, but once once you once you have insurance, um, they can't deny you coverage um, as as long as you meet the FAA qualifications, both for the airplane and the and the pilot. Great, thanks, Mike, for the, the answer to that and for the whole uh, webinar. Really, really informative. Uh, I think uh, a lot of honest advice for owners out there. Again, for folks who want to learn more, uh, sporties.com/bap for Breakdown Assistance Program, or SavvyBreakdown.com, more information there uh, on the, this specific Breakdown Assistance Program and how to sign up. Uh, our email addresses are there as well. We thank you for attending tonight, and again, a recording of this will be available in the next couple of days at sporties.com slash webinars. With that, we thank you for joining us and uh, hope to see you again on another Sporties webinar. Thank you, everybody. Mike, if you can throw it back to me, I'll end the recording.